Hello, and thank you for the introduction. It's an enormous honor to be here. Um, as, I, as Adam said, I've been asked to tell my story of how I started working and thinking on food and how this thinking's evolved over time as a way of linking and raising some of the, the big issues that we're going to be discussing today. And I'm going to emphasize the story bit because food is about stories, the grand themes of life and death, excess and insufficiency, pillaging and plenty. And it's also apt that I focus on stories because what kicked off my way into food was studying English literature at university. Now, literature is full of different people's visions of humanity and their potential. And what today will show is that the different things that people say about food and that reflects their visions, the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and where we should be going. And one thing about studying literature is that you need to know a bit about the Bible to read much of Western literature because it's so strong in shaping our literary metaphors and mindsets. And I speak as an atheist, but right at the heart of not just the Christian myth, but that of many other religious traditions, is a garden of abundance and plenty from which we've been exiled. And that myth, as well as its counter myths, have a very strong resonance within the environmental community today, which is worth bearing in mind. So my story, I read literature, which was frankly not great for job prospects. And then I did a master's, followed by some voluntary work in India, where I realized exactly the scale of my own insignificance. So I decided to come back to the UK, look to my own backyard, and got very interested in some of the ideas of the alternative food movement. And I got started to work for a small NGO where I set up a project that looked at urban agriculture, and which we'll be maybe hearing more about today, uh, which spoke to my enthusiasm for urban utopias about how we could link health and vibrant communities and greener cities. And at the same time, I also got really interested in climate change, which was becoming more and more topical. And, and the environmental movement was talking a lot about food miles, seeing them as the arteries of evil globalization with its attendant ills, including carbon emissions. And I wanted to think more about this, so I moved to another NGO where I set up a project which was started ostensibly to look at, at food miles and to campaign for more local food. But then I started talking to lots of people, and, and I started to think, well, hang on, is shorter, fewer, less distance actually better? What happens when you think about the mode of transport, air versus shipping, and what if something is local but kept for ages in energy using cold storage? So, and around this time, I came across some quite early studies, a lot of them by Swedish researchers, that were looking at impacts, carbon impacts along the whole food chain, agriculture, processing, refrigeration, cooking, waste, and, and that these could have bigger impacts than transport, and that there could be trade-offs between one stage and another. And I realized it was tremendously complicated, but also really important, because it seemed that the food system had these massive impacts on climate but there didn't seem to be an organization that was set up to look at these issues in the round. How does food contribute to climate change and what can we do to reduce them? So I thought, well, wouldn't it be a good idea if I set up a network to do just that? So that's what I did. I set up the Food Climate Research Network, which is now at Oxford. And, and looking back, I was hugely naive. I didn't know my nitrous oxide from my nematodes. I had no idea that food was so politicized. And, but I have learned, I've learned a lot about that. And, and I think what's, for me, my understanding and that of the Food Climate Research Network in many ways mirrors the changing preoccupations and insights of the many different stakeholders within the food movement. So we've moved on from just asking how does food contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and how can we reduce them, to recognizing the importance of what we eat as much as how we produce on these impacts, with a rising understanding of the importance of meat, and realizing that different ways of producing and distributing and consuming foods reflect health, environment, jobs, animal welfare, power relations in very different and often conflicting, contradictory ways. And we've shifted from talking about a food chain to a food system that brings in people and institutions and power relations. So I think where we are today is that we all agree we have massive problems that we need to solve. But people prioritize these problems differently, and they disagree about what we ought to do. And so I think 
that's where we are. We all want a greener, fairer, uh, healthier food system. Who could possibly disagree? But people's different vision of what this looks like, what good actually looks like, can differ quite wildly. Because I think when we talk about cattle and corporations, trade and transgenics, plates and planets, when we analyse our problems and propose solutions, there is a subtext that runs through the stories we tell and the arguments we make. And that subtext is really about other things, like our relationship with nature. What is it? Can we integrate with it? Should we? What is the legitimacy of modifying our environment as opposed to adapting to it? What about ideals about scale? Is big better or small sustainable? What's the balance between individual freedom and collective responsibility? How immutable are culture, tra tradition, pleasure? And is growth necessary? Or should we simply strive for enough, for la gomme, as you Swedes say? And if we had this balance, would we actually want it? And I think ultimately, perhaps, the deeper questions that we are debating are these. Can technology save the day? And more fundamentally, should it? If the problem is us, our human nature, and the social structures that reflect it, will technology simply open the doors of one prison into a larger one? So, is the priority to change ourselves? And which approach, the technological or the radical, or the, or the societal, is the more radical? So, I return to the Garden of Eden. Are we actually exiled? And either way, are we doomed, or are we free to forge a new and better world? Over to you.